understands that businesses are run by people with families as opposed to being faceless organizations. Um, she, she knows that, uh, you know, she's got to establish the conditions that create success. And the conditions I'm talking about always are, you've got to go ahead, you've got to remove the barriers that are out there to uh, allow business to prosper, prosper, and you've got to do it in support of those individuals that work with you. And so she does a great job of team building as a result of that business acumen. Uh, on the very positive side, she understands risk, but more importantly, as every one of you, she understands how to mitigate risk. And that's a big, big deal when you're dealing with a business uh, that has to uh, uh, put all of those pieces together. <coughs> Communities don't survive unless the economic uh, engine in a community survives. She understands that, uh, ensures every cabinet agency understands that small business is the economic engine for the state of South Carolina. Um, she knows it so well that she literally beats the, uh, the cabinet members into understanding that. And I'll give you just a short DMV, uh, you know, uh, expo expose. When we started the COVID lockdowns in March of uh, 19, uh, we didn't shut down, but we had so many constraints in place that allowed us to operate freely <clears throat> that at the end of uh, April, we were $40 million behind collections. The end of the fiscal year is June 30th. By the end of June 30th, in terms of opening the aperture and making us successful, we had not only broken every financial record bringing business in, but we were plus $40 million from the previous high before. A lot of that can be attributed to how you all were, and it sort of shocked me, selling cars. Because a lot of that engine opened on up and all of a sudden, you know, think about what it would have been like had the DMV not been open for you for those car sales. Not gonna let those things close. Let's see, uh, she is, uh, you know, pushes the full employment piece in South Carolina and wanted to see everybody get back to work early. And as a result, that economic engine that started in South Carolina started to feed the East. But the DMV, for example, did not close for a single day. I think the car dealers benefited. I think the economy benefited. And that doesn't come from not understanding business. Uh, and as a result, it is my honor to go ahead and introduce uh, not a politician, but a businesswoman that understands the community better than anybody I know, the 93rd Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina, Pam Avet. Uh, I understand we have South Carolina people and the other Carolina people, but after you hear me talk and what we're doing, I'm sure you're all going to want to become South Carolina people, and I will welcome you personally. Uh, I think Kevin, my dear friend, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I may have to bring him with me everywhere I go. That's very nice. I am the 93rd Lieutenant Governor of the great state of South Carolina. I'm the first female Republican Lieutenant Governor ever voted here in our state, so it's a huge honor. Um, I'm also the first lieutenant, thank you lady, I'm also the first lieutenant governor to be elected with the governor. So uh, Kevin touched a little bit on my story. Um, my husband and I uh, started a payroll company that turned into a national payroll company. We operate in 49 states. Um, I have since stepped away once I took my role as lieutenant governor, but I have always been in the business world. Started out as an accountant out of school. And I will tell you, for anybody that uh, doesn't know your elected officials, there's very few accountants that sit in any state capital. I can tell you that for sure. Um, and then uh, got to know Governor McMaster. He uh, ascended, and then Governor Nikki Haley became Ambassador Haley. And uh, got to know each other. And one day I got this call, uh, and he said, Pamela, and if you've ever heard our governor talk, he has a really great South Carolina accent. He said, why don't you come on down to Columbia? And so I told my husband, I said, oh my gosh, the governor called me. He wants me to come down to Columbia. 
And he said, whatever he asks you, just say no. <laughs> we don't have time, you're on too many boards, we have three children, my mother lives with me, and we have a national corporation. And I said, absolutely, I will say no to whatever. So he calls me down, and to my surprise, asked me to run with him as, as his lieutenant governor. He wanted a lieutenant governor that had a fresh vision, that was all about business, that could come to Columbia, uh, and put a fresh set of eyes on all the policies that were happening. And so when I called my husband back, uh, I said, you'll never believe what the governor asked me. And he said, I'm sitting down. I said, he asked me to run as his lieutenant governor. And he said, what did you say? That's all he wanted to know. But he has been amazing. Uh, he has held down the fort with our business. Uh, I told him, look at what I'm leaving you. Make sure it looks this way when I ever decide to come back from Columbia. Uh, and he does hold down the fort because being in public office is really, it's a family endeavor. Uh, it brings your children in, it brings your spouse in, um, and so we get shot at from all different directions and it's really harder on our families and us on us. So uh, it's good to have them all in your court. So the governor said to me, he said, I'm so excited about us running together. You're gonna love what we do. This is gonna be so much fun. And then a year in, we, have a pandemic, COVID-19 happened. Uh, my first year, I spent traveling around the state. I decided to be a hands-on lieutenant governor just like I was a hands-on business owner. So I went every day and met with businesses and met with teachers and met with associations because I wanted to hear firsthand where your pain points were. I can't help you. I always tell people, uh, don't ever assume I know your problem. There's way too many industries, even in a small state like South Carolina, but I will listen if you tell me, and I'll do whatever I can to help you. I don't think I can solve every problem, but I can get you to somebody who might be able to solve your problem. So that's what I spent my first year doing. It was so exciting. We were focusing in South Carolina on education, specifically 4K education, on getting our businesses what they needed, uh, to keep growing South Carolina. For any of you who don't know, I mean, we manufacture more cars and tires in South Carolina than anywhere in the world. Very happy that we're so close to our port. The port of Charleston is gonna be the widest, deepest port on the East Coast. Uh, and we have two inland ports, which makes South Carolina very attractive to manufacturers from all around the globe. Got to go down the port and see what happened was so excited going into that second year in 2020. South Carolina was booming. We had a $2 billion surplus. We were gonna focus a lot of that on education, as I said, especially that early 4K education to get our numbers up. We were gonna enhance our technical schools because South Carolina has the best technical colleges anywhere in the country. And I know because I spar with my lieutenant governors from across, uh, across the country to tell them what we do here. We put a big focus on be pro, be proud. Making sure that we stood up so that parents would know it is okay when your child doesn't want to go to a four-year university. The path to success doesn't lie in a four-year degree. Uh, it's a way to get there, but so are our technical schools. We know that because South Carolina is also leading in advanced manufacturing. So we were going to push our be pro, be proud, do more to let our parents understand what we do here in South Carolina showcasing our technical schools. Then COVID happened. Wow. So as you heard me say, $2 billion going into COVID, what I'm so proud of is because of the leadership of this state, we came out of COVID with a surplus. Lots of states went into COVID with a surplus, but South Carolina came out, and that was due to really good fiscal policies that we kept here in our state. All kinds of things happened. Where South Carolina different is we did not shut down our state. We knew we needed to keep people being able to fend for their families. Small businesses needed to keep running. So that's what we did. We tapped the brakes early on. We were the last state east of the Mississippi uh, to do any kind of closures, and we were the first state to open up. We never called a business essential or non-essential. Because being a business owner myself, and because I'm looking out at a bunch of business owners, uh, you would never want somebody to call your business non-essential because it's essential to you and all the people that you work for. So we never did that. We looked at industries that we knew would be close contact where spread could happen, uh, and we tapped the brakes on them for the shortest amount of time so we can get our hospitals to get their arms around it. And as a business owner, I think I am most proud of that we did here in South Carolina is the governor uh, came up with a task force 
was a 30-day task force called Accelerate SC. And what we did is we brought our higher ed, our K through 12, we brought associations, we brought our hospital community, we brought state, local, and federal legislators in South Carolina to the table. And as a business owner, I can tell you the one thing that used to always frustrate me was that in all the states we operated in, government never came and asked us what we thought, what we needed or what we could do. And so it was the proudest thing sitting up there with the governor and having business at the table to say, how do we help you? How do we help you get consumer confidence back so people will come out of their house and come back to restaurants or buying cars or going to a, a store, a retail store? And that's what we did. So for 30 days, we worked with all of South Carolina to see how we could get our state back open and do it the right way. We also worked on what do business need? What are you most worried about? And that's where we passed this year legislation to make sure that you could not be sued uh, in a COVID-related injury. We sheltered that here. We gave you a safe harbor, which we were really happy about because that was the number one thing we heard of. The biggest thing we wanted to show the people and the businesses in South Carolina is that we were going to be transparent with all the federal dollars that were coming in. You know, the first wave of CARES money, how was that going to be distributed? We never want anybody to feel like we were tipping the scales on one industry or another. So what we did with those Accelerate SC meetings is we televised them. There was never a meeting that happened behind a closed door. SCETD came in, they filmed every single one. Where we talked about openly how money would get distributed to small businesses and what we could do to make it fair. We kind of, in 30 days, that was the maximum time. We didn't want to start a new branch of bureaucracy at all. So after that, we kind of, you know, we broke up the band, but we brought it back together here about a month ago because now we have more money coming down from the federal government. Dollars that we want to make sure are being spent wisely here in South Carolina. We want to make sure they're being spent with transparency. So now what we're doing is we're sitting down to figure out how do we get out small business grants? How do we work on infrastructure? You know, South Carolina, I'm, I'm very proud, as, as small of a state as we are, I think we're the fourth leading state in the country with state roads that have to be maintained. So Christy Hall with SCDOT is doing a great job. I know if you live on a street that you hate, uh, you probably don't think that, but I always try to tell people, if you're on a road that hasn't gotten fixed yet, you should consider yourself lucky because it wasn't worse than the road that's getting fixed on today. Um, Secretary Hall has done a great job with the gas tax. She, if any of you are wondering what roads are about to be fixed here in South Carolina, I encourage you all to go on SCDOT's website. Take a look at what she is doing uh, as far as laying out by county what roads are being fixed, what roads have been fixed, what roads are in the process of being bidded on with her timeline. She will tie it back to every penny of gas tax that has been collected here in South Carolina. Doing a big um, focus on bridges here this year, so I'm excited about what's happening in that direction. Coming out of COVID, uh, South Carolina ended up being $700,000 uh, in the black, which is amazing coming out of COVID. We did not uh, cut one single state-funded program during that time period. We are doing, it has just been amazing the amount of growth we've had here in our state and will continue to grow. Uh, 67 people move into the state of South Carolina every single day. I like to think that's because they like the way our state is being run. I know business does. I meet with businesses from all across the globe and that's what they've said. You know, if you go to any website on any state, any commerce website, they'll say they're a pro-business state. But here in South Carolina, we have walked the walk we talked. We feel like we have given people a very good indication of how we cherish business here in our state by the way we handled their needs during COVID. Because of our research hospitals, because of uh, our pro-business acumen, we're seeing uh, growth in all different industries not just anymore in advanced manufacturing, but in the life science world. And we're seeing that coming in from countries like Switzerland and Germany coming here. Our growth is endless. I'm very excited about what's happening and what we're gonna see in the year ahead. 
Uh, we have a lot of great things that we passed legislatively this year. We passed the heartbeat bill which we are very proud of here in South Carolina. That's what we heard from people. People were very uh, proud of supporting life. We've also worked on our 4K education. We've given our teachers raises. We're doing everything we can to make sure that we, um, we protect the future, and the future is our children. So we're protecting that all the way around here in our great state. We're also looking forward at what's happening <coughs> in our colleges and technical colleges investing more and more money into them and programs that are available to them because we need to create the ge next generation of workers. We want to make sure we're continuing to grow because all those kids growing up are going to need cars at some point. So we want to make sure we get them through school. If they can get past DMV, then we'd head them to you next. Um, but what I want to do is, is I can tell you all kinds of great things that are happening here in our state, but I want to hear from you. And maybe you have some specific questions that deal with your industry or just things that you're, um, you're, you just want to know more about. So I'm going to open it up the floor and ask any of you, you can ask me any question you want. You won't hear that. My colleagues will not always let you ask what any question you want, but I will. So you guys are being very okay, kind. I'll, I'll be first. I was yeah, you'll you start the ball rolling. <laughs> okay, this is specific DMV related. Um, we have in South Carolina specifically a four page, uh, what we call a PTO form. It's affidavit, notification, transfer of motor, motor vehicle. And everything else we use is laser. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out where we need to start to move toward a laser form and get rid of that carbon form if it's possible. Kevin, that's you, but you don't need a mic. You just stand up and talk. That's exactly what I'll do. Um, Number one, what, one of the things we do in South Carolina that I am proud of is we have a stakeholder meeting. And so, uh, and this is not a cheap shot, but you know me, I'm going to be direct. Until you bring it up, I can't read your mind, okay? I'm willing to look at something like that. I want to look at something like that. But in 10 years, it's the first time somebody's asked me about something with a laser printer or a laser phone. <laughs> so let's get together following this, have a conversation. Uh, I don't know whether or not we can do it or not because I've got to understand the business process that it will take. But if I can find a way to make your job easier, it will make my job easier. And I know the Lieutenant Governor is going to beat me up for what I'm going to say. But if I can make it easier by keeping you the hell out of my DMV, I'm all in. <laughs> You gotta love Kevin. He just does not hold back. But you know, this goes into what I said at the beginning when I started talking. Don't assume we know where your pains are. We can't know unless you tell us. And that's as, if you've been feeling that, I'm glad you got a chance to say it. And I know if anybody can fix it, it'll be this guy right here. Nobody else. Wow, you guys are easy. Third graders come to the Capitol all the time, and I get asked all kinds of hard questions. How many marble pieces are on the on the floor on the first level? How tall is the is the Capitol? And uh, all kinds of things. I make Micah uh, uh, in my office Google everything because I don't want to be you know uh, I don't want to be dumber than a third grader, right? I can't. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Well, you will definitely see me running with the lieutenant as the lieutenant governor in 2022 with our great governor, Governor McMaster. Uh, we have one more term together. And then we'll see. You know, I, always, I never thought really five years ago I'd be standing where I am today. So I always say, you know, God dreams a bigger dream for me than I can dream for myself. And I kind of go with it and hope he stays, stays right next to me as I go through it. But thank you. That's very kind. I'm from the great state of North Carolina. And the other uh, state, Gary. <laughs> the other Carolina. <laughs> uh, how is the relationship, working relationship with the North Carolina Lieutenant Governor and, and do y'all interact frequently? And what is that relationship like? Well, we do. So I'm part of RLJ, which is the Republican Lieutenant Governors Association and the NLGA, uh, which is the national. So it brings both sides of the aisle together. Uh, the sad part is when at NLJ you can see just how far apart we are. I have a great relationship with, uh, with your Lieutenant Governor. He's a great guy, came on the scene last year, and he had a great relationship with um, Dan Forrest, your prior Lieutenant Governor. He was probably the first Lieutenant Governor to call me um, when I uh, got on the ticket after the primary. So, um, you know, we have great relationships. It's hard. It's definitely hard when you're dealing with your Governor. It, it, 
and we're not on the same side on most issues, right? You all are still under an emergency order, and we were just talking about how hard that is. I think what that's done, it showed the contrast between blue states and red states. Um, you know, the only focus we had, most people don't realize this, uh, and I didn't. I, my husband and I had dinner with Knut Fleur and his wife. He's the president of BMW. 2020 was their most profitable year ever. 2020, I mean, years where things were closed down, and he um, attributes that to good administration um, at the executive branch. Uh, their only slowdown came from supply chains to states that you know just closed down manufacturing and they couldn't get things out. I think what we're looking at here in South Carolina, COVID did a lot of, we were talking at this table at lunch, COVID did a lot of bad things, right? It, it shut people down, it, it made us deal with things we never had to deal with. But it really did a lot, of, it, it really brought light to a lot of things. One, why we need to have things manufactured in our own country, right? So bringing business back on shore, that's something we're concentrating on here in South Carolina. I'm so proud of our businesses, how they pivoted and changed during COVID, how they started making masks, how they started making face shields. It's amazing American technology, American ingenuity. Uh, it hasn't died. Uh, and I think people are seeing that. So we're focusing heavily on that here in South Carolina. Um, so I'm really, I'm grateful for some of the things that came to be. I think if we, if we don't forget the lessons we learned, and I know we won't here in our state, I think good things are gonna come. I think parents getting involved in their children's education, uh, also a very big thing, right? I think parents assumed what was being taught in schools for a long time, and now they're seeing, I think we value teachers and what they do every day. Uh, I know as a mother, my youngest is going into ninth grade. I, I, it just reconfirmed the fact that I would have never been a good teacher. Not at all. Um, but I think, you know, it did, it did bring a lot of things to light for us as, as, a, as a country and as a nation. So very proud of what we're doing here in South Carolina. Um, 2022 is going to be a telling year for businesses all, all across our country. What is the state doing at the state level to control inflation? So what are we doing? So what we're trying to do is not inject a lot of false money, right? We're trying to make sure that what we're doing uh, here in South Carolina with money that's coming in from the federal government is do programs, not develop new programs that are gonna take money going forward, uh, but do something that will actually make, create a big impact, a one-time spend, so that we don't have to go back to our taxpayers to keep funding a new phase of bureaucracy. Uh, that's what we've been instructed to do. That's what the governor has given everybody uh, their marching orders for with Accelerate SC. We're actually in South Carolina looking at lowering taxes. We want to make sure um, that taxes continue to go down in our state. It has not, uh, not gotten our attention that states like Florida and Tennessee and Texas that have zero tax have uh, some huge uh, amounts of surplus at the end. Uh, the governor brought in uh, Art Laffer and uh, he, was the, uh, he was the finance guy for President Reagan, and, and he just written a new book. And so we heard him speak, and it was, it, as an accountant, it wasn't surprising to me, but it was amazing how the light bulb went off in the room with so many people, is he talked about a business, if you're gonna get hit with a $3 million tax bill, you'll spend $2 million to save $3 million, right? Because you're gonna, you're, you're a million up. But states like Tennessee and Florida and Texas that have, you know, they have zero tax. They'll pay more tax in other areas. They won't look to try to get out of it because they're not going to spend, you know, three million to save a million. They'll just pay the million dollars in tax. And so that's how these states are ending up with big surpluses. And that's what we all need to look at is if you tax people reasonably. Nobody's going to try to get out of tax, and your state profits more. So I think just those kind of good conservative fiscal principles is going to help South Carolina keep their taxes down. And the governor and I will be working with our legislature uh, to do some tax reductions now that we've kind of gotten on the other side of COVID. All right, well, you guys were a great audience. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time with a great state in South Carolina.
And I am also from the other state. So I also have to recognize for all of you who are from the other state that we have one of our own with us, Representative Brendan Jones, who is you know, a, an independent dealer in two lines, and as importantly, he is the assistant majority leader in the House, and you cannot believe it. our industry from what the other from what the other state wants to do to you unlike South Carolina. Brendan, thank you for being here. We'd love to give you a few minutes. You're gonna be speaking on Saturday night. But if you'd like to say hello to your own colleagues, we certainly want you to be able to do that. There's times in your life that you really hate being second, Lieutenant Governor. I hate being second. <laughs> but uh, I am the pro representative in, in North Carolina. What I mean by pro, I'm pro God, I'm pro life, I'm pro business, and hey, I'm pro dealer. I have the same pleasure of being able to serve in the people's seats. This is my third term. Uh, I too serve as a Republican. I came from a district that had never elected a Republican since Reconstruction. I actually won in a seat that was a D13, meaning there was 13 Democrats to every Republican, and I won that seat by 28 points. The reason I was able to win that seat was I did something that my predecessors never did. I cared. I went door to door. I worked every fire department. I went to every rescue unit. I went to every car lot you could go to. And I'm very proud of one thing that's never been done. I received 14% of the minority vote in my district, which is unheard of because we relate more than we're different. And sometimes people are just not told that. North Carolina is a little bit different than South Carolina. We've got a split. We have a Democrat governor. We've got a Republican House and Senate. The legislature did something pretty dumb a few years ago and they gave our governor veto power. So the governor has now withheld billions of dollars from the citizens. We too, just like with South Carolina, we're looking at all the art money and the federal money coming in, and we're at a fear again that our governor is going to veto that. This governor has a distinction that no other governor in the history of North Carolina has. He's vetoed 53 good pieces of legislation against North Carolina citizens. And what I mean by good pieces of legislation, one, the budget that funds our teachers, our highway patrols, our roads, things that we need. We didn't have the heartbeat bill, but we had the born alive bill. And the governor didn't think it was important enough for the sanctity of life, and he vetoed that as well. So North Carolina citizens, you've heard some great stuff from our Lieutenant Governor over the line in the other Carolina. <laughs> Elections have consequences. They really do. And it's time for the citizens of North Carolina to do something that I have pleaded in my own district, but I'm gonna plead to you guys because you're gonna be all over the state. Start voting with your conscience and not with colleagues, not with what's popular in your community. Do the right thing. Thank the good Lord that our governor does not have a checkbook pen because he would bankrupt us. But the Republican controlled legislature since 2010 when we took over from the previous administration, North Carolina was $2 billion in debt to the federal government. Under the leadership of Tom Tillis and Governor Pat McCrory, not only did we pay that $2 billion off, we put a $2 billion surplus in in less than four years. Our rainy day fund, that which we need, the Lieutenant Governor understands that because of all the catastrophes that we have with hurricanes and such, if we get our way and we get the right things done, we'll have $5 billion in a rainy day fund and we'll have a balanced budget. Now, as far as dealer stuff, Section 20 of the General Statute in North Carolina started out in about 1935. Now that's about the last time it was done. <laughs> Term salesman's defined 12 different ways under that statute. Last session was the first time we revisited that a car actually had to have two tail lights in the state of North Carolina. Uh, and the reason that came about is we had to release a uh, convicted murderer on a technicality because it was found improbable that he, the policeman could not stop him on that cause. 
So things that we're doing, we'll talk about tomorrow, but I can promise you we're streamlining. I sure wish I had a kernel in my state that felt like you do. Uh, the problem with split government is, is a true battle of, of ideologies. Uh, we want to be pro-business. We want to cut the red tape. And you guys know, I heard about paperwork for South Carolina. Try selling a used car in North Carolina. It's about 14, 15 documents. So we're sitting with DMV. We're encouraging them to look at our documents to streamline that process for us. Um, just trying to, as each one of you know, we all shop at Mannheim in, in North Carolina. We still use the old paper <coughs> renewals. And a lot of times they'll be 30 days late, Mannheim cuts you off. I'm going to have it now where there's a 30-day grace period of your license and Mannheim can't cut you off. So there's a lot of little things like that we're going to do. It's just an honor to serve you. It's the first time I believe that we've ever had a used car dealer, especially a small used car dealer. Not one real smart. I started my second lot the week COVID hit, so we won't go there. Um, but I mean, I, I understand what you're facing. I, I signed the front and the back of a check, so I get it. I know how important this stuff is. And the governor hit on one thing, and I'll, I will leave with that, is tax is one thing North Carolina has done. We do have a great tax package in place to once again reduce. And 90% of our citizens now, the way we have structured in the legislature, do not pay state income tax. And our goal is to hit it at zero for everyone. So I will, uh, I will leave you with that. I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. John, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, God bless. Thank you, Mr. John. So I'm joined by South Carolina Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Pamela Abbott. Thank you so much for being here today and taking some time with the dealers. Love what you had to say about South Carolina and the pro-business stance and really how the state has sort of navigated this whole crisis over the last year. Well, I want to thank you all so much for having me. This was a wonderful event. I mean, it's always great to be in a room with other small business owners and to hear what they have to say and to hear what we can do to make this better for them. Thank you for what you guys do because it's these associations that really help everybody grow. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.